All right, thanks for coming. Um, first off, how many of you live in a tiny home? Anyone? Be proud. We got one. We have one person living in a tiny home, awesome. Um, all right, well thank you all for coming to People's Liberty. I'm really proud to call this part of my office space for the year. Um, some of you here because you know me, other of you might be tiny home fanatics, you got a tiny home owner. Um, or maybe you're just a frequent attendee of Creative Mornings. I hope you leave here as part of the tiny home revolution, at least as an empathizer. Um, so as said, uh, I am one of two Hale Fellows this year at People's Liberty, which means I've been given a lot of money and most importantly, incredible support uh, to execute a project. Uh, my project is called Start Small. Uh, the goal is to explore affor tiny living uh, as a solution to affordable housing. What that means is I'm going to be building two tiny homes in Over the Rhine this year with the goal of making them affordable, creating a home ownership opportunity for someone earning $10 an hour. But we're here to talk about tiny living uh, and revolution. And critical to any revolution uh, is the context that it evolves in. You might think of revolution as some large scale event or big happening, and that, that's really important to create an opportunity for the revolution to occur. Um, but I think we need to keep in mind some of the, the context that has helped to frame that revolution. Um, I'll also be getting everyone up to speed on the same level to what a tiny home is, and then uh, speak about how the revolution has already begun and how I think it can have its largest impact. Uh, so before we get into tiny homes, we're going to start a little bit smaller. Um, this is a photograph of me, my cousins, uh, my brother who is over here. He's the goofy looking one in orange. Um, <laughs> but th this, this photograph is important because I think it starts to talk about uh, how I kind of grew up making things. This is a bridge I built with my cousins over a creek. It wasn't monstrous, um, but it was big enough that uh, the oldest of the ones up there weren't able to jump over it. So we just decided to build a bridge. I think this is one of the hallmarks of uh, the tiny house movement, is people just taking action and making things. Um, I also grew up building forts in the woods by my house. I think this was uh, really important to me developing as an architect, um, just changing the environment. And that's, again, part of what the tiny house movement is about, people taking action and, and manipulating their environment. Uh, these are two other structures I built during my time at the University of Michigan in the summers. Um, so after you know goofing around in the woods and everything, I got a little bit more serious, went to architecture school. Um, and both of these are storage structures. The one on the left is a painting space above, kind of a backyard storage structure. Um, and this starts to talk about the tiny house movement, um, the idea of a tiny cabin, let's say, in the woods, moving out of the woods into a backyard. Um, and being something that more people is, are visible with, um, that they can see. It also talks about, I think, that you can still have a phenomenal space even in a tiny storage unit or storage shed uh, like you see on the right. So tiny living and stuff aren't always compatible. And after building those two, two storage spaces, um, I took my, my thesis work um, and photographed every single one of the possessions in my apartment. So this is a lot of stuff. I didn't realize how much I actually had, even though I've been uh, moving you know, for internships and things like that. You get a little bit more familiar when you have to pack everything up and move. Um, but during my thesis in architecture school, I photographed everything, uh, every single thing. It's a lot of stuff. Um, and you don't really realize it until you actually do photograph everything. Um, so this is really important message. If you're interested in living in a tiny home, 
You must get rid of your shit. You have to. There's just no other way. All right? um, and most of it's useless and meaningless anyways. Uh, so this starts to frame the tiny house uh, movement a little bit more, where, where my interest comes from. And I'll come back to some of this research uh, in a little bit. Um, so what is a tiny home? Uh, it's not for tiny people. Uh, it's not a tiny home for ants. Uh, most are big enough, I would say, that the first row here could uh, have a dinner party in one. You have to get creative. Uh, so this space is about 1,200 square feet total. Uh, and for me, this is my own personal definition, a tiny home is smaller than 300 square feet uh, or 100 square feet per person. Um, so size matters when it comes to a tiny home. And you can decide uh, what that threshold is for you, how low you can go. And they're not for everyone. So what do these look like? Uh, most of you have probably seen tiny homes on wheels. It's kind of all the rage these days on some TV shows. I'll kind of mention those a little bit later. Um, but they can also be on the water, in the air. Uh, tiny homes don't have to be alone. And this is kind of where, if you hear me say tiny house, I'm talking about uh, an individual house, most likely on wheels. A tiny home, though, home is where your stuff is. Um, and so a, t a tiny house can be, is a tiny home, um, but it can also be in a village. It can be part of co-housing. Uh, it can be uh, an apartment tower uh, that's currently being constructed in New York right now. The middle image, uh, the units are about 225, 250 square feet. Uh, and these you might be a little bit less familiar with, but I think are really important to the tiny home revolution. So tiny homes may be a bit of a, tiny houses might be a bit of a novelty, uh, but they're not new. That's been happening for a long time. And the root of the word revolution itself implies a turnaround. And in this case, we're kind of revolving to something in the past. Uh, people have been living in small homes for a long time. It might be economical reasons. Maybe it's just the environment they live in, the context that they live in. Or it could just be because they enjoy the small space. It, that is a choice people have. Um, so this is a modern example in Japan, built in the early 70s. Uh, it served as both office and residential units. And it's given rise over time to capsule hotels. If you're not familiar with capsule hotels in Japan, I seriously encourage you to look these up. Uh, they really push the limits of what tiny living could be, at least for a short period of time. Um, so Japan and elsewhere kind of have these examples of, of tiny homes, I think, much more prevalent uh, than in America. Um, and this chart highlights, um, you know, if you're thinking, who lives in a tiny home? You might be thinking of uh, the hipster millennial. Uh, but I think it's much more than that. So you can take in some of these numbers. One of the most important ones, I would say, is the 40% of people 50 years or older are living in tiny homes. So you might be surprised by that. Uh, so I'll let you take in some of these. My mom's here, she'll be really happy that I'm showing this image. She loves this show. Um, so who are you picturing in uh, tiny homes, right? Um, and historically, who, who's living in small places? Uh, what's their economic level? Who are these people? Uh, what do you picture them like? And tiny houses look like RVs or trailers. Um, and they might have that um, similarity. But that also brings with it some negative connotations of people living in trailer parks. Who are these people, um, these shady characters here? Uh, you might not want to live next to them. So, you know, the tiny homes moving in. Oh, is it going to bring with it uh, Ricky or Bubbles here? Um, so this is a Canadian show called Trailer Park Boys, where these guys typically get up to no good every episode. Um, but tiny houses are flourishing despite these negative connotations. <clears throat> so many of you are probably familiar with cribs if you uh, grew up in the 90s, like myself. Um, it was a time of surplus and bling, which is awesome, but also kind of bad as well. Um, so I kind of envy crib owners. I always loved the homes. I loved watching the show. And you have a dude with 15 bedrooms, uh, eight bathrooms, 10 cars, a bowling alley, a basketball court, all in his home. Uh, three kitchens, what do you need that for? Um, so this was a, kind of a teenager's dream, I think, for most of my generation, the downhill uh, MTV generation. Um, so, you know, 
Who, who wouldn't want a basketball court or a heliport? Am I right? Uh, but you know you've hit the big time when you have your own show, and tiny house shows are everywhere. And they're also in the news routinely. Um, but just like in Cribs, uh, when 50 Cent is posing with Lamborghinis he doesn't actually own, uh, or Ja Rule is showing off this house that he actually rents, um, it's still TV. It's, it's not reality. Uh, if you do want to look at a good picture of what I think tiny house reality is, I would check out the Netflix documentary uh, where this kid takes it upon himself to build a home. Uh, it's a struggle. It's not easy just to throw up some walls and be, I'm done, I have a home. Um, but these shows have helped bring uh, the faces of tiny homeowners into the general public and make it popular. Um, it's made it real. It shows the possibilities of what you can actually do in a tiny home without seeing it in person, uh, which is evident here. We only have one person that lives in a tiny home. Uh, not everyone's able to see what that looks like. But we all love our stuff, right? I love stuff. Uh, that's one of the reasons I can't live in a tiny home right now. I have too much stuff that I like, that I think I need. Um, how many of you have rented a storage unit in the past? Don't be shy, it's all right, I have too. So a lot more people have rented a storage unit that live in a tiny home. Uh, there is enough storage, self-storage space in America for all of us and everyone else in America to lay down next to each other. It's a lot of space, over three times the size of Manhattan. We have so much stuff that we're building a storage unit in a tower downtown. <clears throat> it's a ton of space, uh, and tiny living has probably both benefited from this, um, but it's also kind of a reaction to this culture of accumulation. Uh, and so I think tiny living takes advantage of the idea that it's, it's better to have access than excess uh, in a culture of collaborative consumption. Uh, so there's a book and website dedicated to this. The book came out um, probably four years ago. Um, but it's, it's the idea that you, know, you can go to the library and now pick up a DVD, a CD, a book. Uh, you don't need to have your own personal library that's one giant room. Uh, you can access all of this sharing it with other people. Uh, this is not, again, just like tiny homes, this isn't a new concept, but I think technology has made it easier to share peer-to-peer not just walking next door and borrowing a cup of sugar from your neighbor, but trading uh, things over the internet with your peers. So, th like I said, there's a variety of online resources to do this. Um, and, you know, just like you're thinking of the Cribs home, someone else probably owns that now. They're probably making a killing on Airbnb. Uh, if they're generous, you know, they might be lending their couch on Couchsurfing a website. Um, but, you can also get something from Amazon tomorrow if you need it. You don't need to stock up and have a stockpile of things. Uh, you can get stuff for free on Craigslist. Um, so like I said, technology has kind of connected us and also connected us with other people's things. So just like sharing objects, you can also share spaces. Um, I guarantee that if you want to go to a bar, you could, some of you might be able to go downstairs, drink with your friends at your own bar in your basement, um, but it's probably not as cool or as awesome as Rheingeist, let's say. And more people are moving into cities, and that means that there's a density there. You can walk to get to things. Um, so this is a list of things I asked people at an event earlier this year. Uh, what are the most important spaces outside of your home? So if you're gonna live somewhere what are the other things that you need? And maybe you can take some of those things out of your home, um, whether that's you know, a formal living room uh, or a dining room. You can take those out of your home and experience those outside of your home. So just like in Cribs, you don't need a basketball court. Just go to the Y and play basketball. Um, so backtracking into American history a bit. Uh, this is a Sears Roebuck home, and I think this has some similarities with the tiny, home, tiny house movement, um, but is also way bigger. A lot of the ones I've seen, the minimum is probably around 800 square feet, uh, but it's a pretty incredible movement. This is the early 20th century. Uh, you can flip through a catalog and purchase a home. It comes shipped to you in a rail car. All your pieces, pre-cut, lumber, boxes and nails, all that. You can do this today. You can go online, surf, search for tiny homes. You can buy the plans. You can also buy the whole unit, all the materials shipped to you, uh, ready to go. 
So Sears, like I said, was the largest manufacturer of these. Um, the distinguishing factor here is, you know, all the different rooms cut up, just like a lot of older homes. Um, and as house design has evolved, spaces have started to open up into like a great room. You have your kitchen, your family room, and your dining room all in one room. And so the, those, the lifestyles and our habits have also changed with that. I would say probably the, the habits have influenced the house designs. Um, and so you have all of those things condensing into one room. And in a tiny home, you have everything condensing into one room. So this shows the uh, average size of a home according to the Home Builders Association. Um, you can see it's dramatically increased with a slight dip around the recession. Um, and then, of course, you know, when interest rates are really low, people with money still have their money, uh, they can afford to buy and spend to get bigger homes. But you can also see uh, at the end of 2014, the last data that came in, showed a slight leveling off. And it is just a small sample size. Uh, so regardless of if that does tick back up, the tiny home movement is persisting in the face of average home sizes rising again. So I talked about the, um, the big event or something that, that created an opportunity for a revolution to take place. And I think the, the big event of our time was the um, financial crisis and a lot of the foreclosures that happened. People really started to reconsider what home means to them, what they need in a home. Um, you also may have been familiar with the Extreme Home Makeover Show. Again, another kind of reality show about homes, usually bigger homes, uh, and unfortunately, oftentimes bigger than what people could afford. Some of those people had to give up those homes, sell them, or did have to foreclose because you know, they couldn't afford the size of their home, they couldn't afford the utility bills to heat or cool that 2,500 square foot home, um, or the maintenance to upkeep such a home. So more people have started to realize that bigger isn't always better. Um, so it's an economic choice, but economics and lifestyle go hand in hand. And what do you want to spend your money on? Is it your 2,500 square foot home, or would you rather be able to travel like a lot of people that have the tiny house on wheels? Um, so this is where the, the tiny house movement becomes uh, the tiny home revolution, is with this opportunity. So the revolution has begun. Uh, I am not the leader of the tiny house movement or any revolution. I don't talk loudly enough. I don't have enough social media followers. Um, the tiny house revolution is in its infancy. Uh, but it will survive because of the, not only the practical reasons behind living, living tiny, uh, but also because there are passionate people out there that want to see it through to the end. Um, and to the end means transforming uh, the, the current institution of what we think of when we think of a home and how that takes place in our cities and elsewhere. So these are three ways, three um, important factors, I think, where the tiny home revolution will to continue to change the way we approach uh, sustainable design, affordable housing, and creative land use. The tiny houses have already started to take advantage of this, and I'll just touch on these, as well as share a little bit more about my project. Uh, so this is Darlene, and this is another example of taking action. Uh, so when Darlene's daughter moved back, from overseas and she was serving. She wasn't able to afford her own home, so her and her husband took it upon themselves to help build her a home in their backyard. So this, this touches on affordable housing. <clears throat> uh, again, action, taking it upon yourself to build something on your own. Um, and it also uh, is an important distinction because it's on the ground. And this is when it becomes real estate, although in this case it's kind of in the backyard, it's not necessarily the primary residence. Um, until the tiny houses are off wheels and on the ground, uh, it's still a trailer. It's still an RV uh, legally. Uh, it's not, it doesn't function as real estate. So at, at uh, a base level, considering that housing should be available for all, this is a movement that's starting to take place across the country. Uh, I think most on, a, on the largest scale in the state of Utah, where they've decided that it's cheaper to provide housing for people experiencing homeless than it is to just deal with them with police officers, um, putting them in jail if they're arrested, uh, other social problems that can occur with people on the streets. Um, so that's, it's called Housing First. Uh, in this case, in Quixote Village in Olympia, Washington, uh, I can't remember, I think there's 20, 20 to 50 units. There's a communal kitchen, uh, but they've been given a home, a place to live, to call their own, uh, 
to, to get their life going in the right direction. This is also occurring in Austin, uh, Eugene, Oregon. Portland has proposed this. The mayor in Portland has supported it. So when I'm talking about affordable housing, what is that? So very simply, it's just when 30% of your income goes to the whole cost of housing. So the whole cost is your mortgage or your rent plus your utilities. So it's not just what you're paying to your landlord. Um, what are you also paying to Duke Energy, to Cincinnati Waterworks, uh, so forth. So affordable housing can be for everyone. Uh, that's the premise. And like I said, what I'm trying to do is create a model of housing um, that's affordable for someone earning $10 an hour. Um, but this goes hand in hand with sustainable design. This is a thermal image of the site where I'm building the two homes. And so when you're, when you're thinking about designing something, you have to, you have to take the, the big picture uh, into perspective. Um, what are the thermal characteristics of the materials? Are they going to hold on to heat? Are they going to reflect heat? Things like that. This is kind of like a, a base understanding that um, to holistically approach sustainable design and long-term savings uh, on, your, on your housing. Uh, so on a much smaller scale, uh, many of the tiny homes have composting toilets and, and poop is kind of disgusting. Uh, Portlandia, I think, really uh, did this really well. Um, you guys should watch that skit as well. Um, but it, it's, it's really important when you start to think about uh, where our waste goes and how that can be reused. Um, and tiny houses have, because they're on wheels typically, they've had to take advantage of technology like uh, newer composting toilets, uh, water tanks on the trailer, things like that. Uh, and I think you'll start to see uh, the impact of this on building codes, which typically, uh, I'm not familiar with many places that allow composting toilets. Cincinnati is one that does not. Recycling gray water is also a hassle in Cincinnati. Um, but this is showing that it's possible. Most tiny homes are off the grid, so they're going to need some sort of um, renewable energy to function. Um, I'm a little bit worried for this kid. Hopefully that snow doesn't fall on him, um, but I think we'll be all right. Um, so again, solar panels and what you can do with this, other forms of renewable energy like wind power and things, I think you're only going to start to see more and more of this. Um, so sustainable, sustainable design and land use, creative land use, I think one of the benefits uh, that has influenced my project is the ability to have a garden in an urban setting. When you have a small footprint, it doesn't take up the whole site. Um, there's a permaganics garden, a permaculture garden down the street uh, from where I'm building the homes uh, at the intersection of Pete and Maine. It's been there for over a decade. Um, and it's about growing food in a very small space with stacked functions, multi-purpose, just like the interior furnings, furnishings you see uh, in a tiny home. Tiny homes can go anywhere, so we're thinking about creative land use. It's, you know, where do you want to put your home? Uh, is it possible to have a tiny home in a parking lot? Can you have it parked in your backyard of your home? Um, can you have tiny homes inside a parking garage, like in Savannah, Savannah's College of Art and Design, the SCAD pad, um, where they've constructed tiny homes in a parking garage? Um, this is an extreme example of where a tiny home could go, but because it's small, it can go a lot of different places that you couldn't build a typical home, a typical size home. Um, and again, coming back to where I think um, the largest impact can be felt is when tiny homes start to um, infiltrate our cities. Um, and the most obvious advantage of a tiny home is the small space that it fits into. So again, the, the investment in place I think is really, really important when it becomes real estate. Uh, so it's one of the most important factors to complete this revolution. Um, tiny homes are built on wheels, are built to circumvent building codes. They don't have to address building codes. Uh, so when we start to address building codes, uh, they're going to start to change. This is already happening in Seattle. Uh, City Council, I believe, uh, voted to lower the minimum dwelling unit size uh, for the city. Um, and this is a big deal. So where is this investment in place for Start Small? Uh, the yellow dot is at the corner, or yellow circle, is at the corner of Pete and Lang. This is north of the Rothenberg Academy, the Moorline Brewery, um, between East Clifton and Mulberry Streets. 
So what does this look like? These are uh, the two designs currently, um, a one-story model and a two-story model. Because these are fitting into an urban condition in historic over the Rhine, they need to, they need to fit into that context. They can't just be um, a glass box um, or other things because of the neighborhood and, and what that's like. But they're still tiny homes and they will function as such. Um, so, tiny, have, tiny home revolution has begun. Um, there are different possibilities how this can play out. Uh, as I said, I think the most important one would be as more tiny homes are built on the ground. Um, and as they continue to challenge land use, are they compatible with cities, compatible in historic districts? Um, can tiny homes on wheels be parked in parking lots? Um, these are questions raised across the country. Lastly, I think tiny homes in America are catching up with most of the rest of the world as a viable choice, and that's really important. It's not just something someone should be forced into. It's a choice that they need to make. And I hope you leave here at least empathizing with a tiny home revolution or joining it. As they always said in Cribs, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Thanks. <laughs>
what I found here in Cincinnati is that the government is really excited about this. Uh, they'd like to see this continue. Um, but again, they, they don't control everything. Um, and the building code is a complex thing that's meant to, to help with life safety, fire issues, things like that. Um, so it's, it's not going to be quick. It's not going to be overnight. Um, but here in Cincinnati, I think, and probably elsewhere, people are open to the idea. Um, well, I think there, there are some challenges building and over the Rhine with the historic code in tiny homes. Um, I mean, you can see in the images that these are much taller than a lot of tiny homes you see. Um, <clears throat> so I think it depends where, if I were to build again, if I'm going to build again, where I'm, I'm going to be building. Um, but to scale it, I think you need something that's replicable, <clears throat> excuse me, replicable because you don't want to be building 10 custom tiny homes. Uh, with 10 different materials and things like that because of the, you're not getting the, uh, the savings. You still have contractors that are going to have to come out to the site. They still have to drive to your site. You're paying for that. They still have to unload all their materials. You're paying for that. So if you're doing this in 10 different places, you're paying that 10 different times. And I think that's uh, part of the challenge to tiny homes is paying for things like that again and again. Have you considered using cargo containers? Uh, I have. Um, but that's, that is a, a, a challenge in itself, um, and I have, did not want to take on too many challenges this year. <laughs> a challenge because it's a cargo container, or a challenge because of like zoning laws? Uh, yeah, it is. I, I'm not sure how it's regulated, I, and I think um, because it's something unconventional, the building code, um, you'd have to have an engineer do all the calculations and things for that because it's not just a standard follow this model and it'll be approved. Um, <clears throat> and just the, the limitations of buying that thing, how you're going to weatherproof it, insulate it, um, all of those things is something unique. As you move away from the city, uh, are there, I guess, does there have to be consideration about building these things as part of a, a community where you don't have the why to go play basketball? Yeah, I think, I think regardless of whether uh, these are in cities or not, I think the, like the village aspect is something that makes it more feasible and easier. Um, you can then do it a lot smaller, and when you have people over, you can go to the community kitchen for that, for that dinner or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but also thinking about um, any sort of apartment or condominium complex today, typically they're having those shared amenities anyway. So if, as you're thinking about aggregating these together, um, I think you need to consider what those other amenities are. Anyone else? How do you see now that we've got <coughs> micro apartments being built in New York, San Francisco, of course you can give the example of Tokyo or Japan in general. Yeah. As you see larger urban spaces needing, um, because of cost of living and cost of housing, do you see that being replicated in smaller urban spaces, or how do you see that changing kind of cultural connotation of what we view as necessary for housing? Yeah, I think uh, places like New York, Japan, obviously they're constrained, and real estate's really expensive there, so it makes sense that those uh, it's happening there first. Um, but I, I believe I saw a news story a couple months ago here in Cincinnati about a developer thinking about doing uh, tiny apartments downtown. So I think, I think it's going to occur. Um, People are open to it. There was a mall in Providence, I think, in Rhode Island, that was converted into tiny apartments on the second floor, and they kept uh, commercial space on the first floor of the, the mall. So I think it's going to happen. So how are you designing and built these houses? Were there any moments where you're like, oh, crap, I forgot to build them? I've got to build this all the bathroom. So I haven't built them yet, uh, and I hope that doesn't happen. Something as large as a bathroom, or, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm working out a lot of the, like, the challenges, the code uh, clearances and things like that. Um, I hope I don't forget the bathroom, but I, I'm, sure, I'm sure something will come up uh, during construction, uh, as typically happens during construction. Yeah. How can we as a community help support you, Brad? <laughs> uh, 
Um, do you want to buy one of these homes, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can, you can definitely come to one of these events. I'm also going to be presenting to the Historic Board again on July 27th. So if you support this, please, please come and say that you want to see this happen in Cincinnati. If you live in Over the Rhine and you're, uh, that has even more weight to say that you support this, um, that's going to be one of the major ways you can help. Uh, I don't, <laughs> if, if I use that language, um, that was unintentional. I think if you're interested in any way, you should come. Interested in the whole idea. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> and and that, that, that first one, I really wanted to get people's opinions who were interested, and, and so that could influence the designs and things. Uh, yeah, I have a couple people that are helping me um, from that that are that have been helping me throughout the project on all different aspects of it. So yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. All right. Um, I'm kind of working that out. The one-story one can be. Uh, unfortunately, just how the bathrooms are designed right now. It, turning radius, things like that doesn't make sense, but they could be. Yeah. So I think that, unfortunately, that, that's yeah, all. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys.